Hi everyone, I'm Libba Beecham, museum educator and director of the Cottrell Digital Studio here at the Northeast Georgia History Center. So thank you so much for joining me today. This is very much an introduction to LGBTQ social and civil rights movements in the United States. So today we're going to take a bird's eye view on this topic as there is, there's a lot to cover. <laughs> and, and really each bullet point in this presentation could be its own program. So I do hope that this will offer a good introduction for you and get you interested in learning more about LGBTQ history. Of course, if you do have questions along the way, I'll be happy to answer them in the comments after the program has concluded. So do feel free to ask questions. And if you would like to donate to the History Centered today, you may do so at the link below. That's bit.ly slash June 21 goal. And every $5 that you donate will also enter you into a raffle to win a really fascinating book called Travels with Foxfire that details the experiences and the culture of Southern Appalachia. So uh, I hope that you uh, enjoy this program and without further ado, uh, let's get started. <laughs> and thanks again for joining us today. So here we are in the early, uh, we'll start, we'll get to the early 20th century, but I'm actually going to start uh, in the 1800s and not in the United States. We're actually going to, uh, we're, we'll focus on the US today, but we'll start in Germany in 1862 with lawyer and writer Karl Ulrichs. Now he stood before the Association of German Jurists and argued against the persecution of people, quote, whose nature has planted them in a sexual nature that is opposite of that which is usual. And this was in 1862. So he was, of course, referring to what we would call generally queer people today or LGBTQ, which stands for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer. So uh, as you can imagine, in 1862, this argument was not received well. And Ulrich wrote extensively on this subject and he created many pamphlets that queer readers found validating for that time. So Ulrich was eventually uh, imprisoned when his home in Hanover, Germany was annexed by Prussia and he was jailed for anti-Prussian activities and eventually left his home country for Italy. So he was not able to continue his writings in Germany for fear of being imprisoned, but he served a very important role in the advocacy of LGBTQ rights. And that would also uh, serve as an important role in the United States. Now, let's go to the United States now. So in the US, uh, Dr. Mary Edwards Walker, she advocated for women's dress reform at the, around the same time. This is in the 1860s, all the way to her final days um, in 1919 when she passed away. And there's no evidence to suggest that Dr. Walker was uh, queer, but she was a leading voice in the women's dress reform movement. And that argued that women should be able to dress as comfortably and practically as men. So she was indeed a, a practicing physician, which was very rare for the time. And she had grown up on a farm with a family of what were called free thinkers. And they were also abolitionists. So they, for the time, thought outside the box, essentially. And, you know, she was uh, arrested for wearing, for wearing men's clothing. And yet she continued to wear what she found practical as a practicing physician. And this was especially so when she served during the American Civil War. She was actually the first woman and still the only woman uh, to receive the Medal of Honor. And her advocacy for dress reform in particular is now closely connected to the reform in the LGBTQ movement as clothing is still a very binary part of American culture that's been challenged in the LGBTQ community and still is to this day. And uh, I, I liked this quote from Miss from Walker simply saying, I don't wear men's clothes, I wear my own clothes. And so in the pictures here, um, we see 
we, we see Ulrichs, of course, and uh, Dr. Walker there. And as we go a bit further into the 19th century, we have the formation of the Order of Caronia, which was a secret society for gay men founded by George Cecil Ives, which you uh, see pictured up there as well, in London. Now, one notable member was author Oscar Wilde. And this secret society, it did expand outside of London and was an influential uh, establishment in, in other societies for gay men. Now, around the same time, the Scientific Humanitarian Committee was formed in Berlin by a physician um, named Magnus Hirschfeld. And the motto of this committee was justice through science, as it was uh, founded mainly to abolish the German Imperial Penal Code, which punished any kind of sexual contact between men. So the committee, it published pamphlets, it sponsored rallies, and it campaigned for reform. And Hirschfeld, uh, pictured this way, he also created the Institute for Sexual Research, which studied human sexuality. But sadly, this institute and its research were destroyed by the Nazi regime under the rule of Adolf Hitler in 1933. So we have the the beginnings of reform when it comes to the expectations of what do men wear, what do women wear, what are the roles, and uh, we have people like Ulrichs who is believed to be the first openly out um, gay man of the 19th century that we have actually documented. So that's really where in the United States, there are these influences that are around that aren't necessarily in the United States, but people are well aware of Ulrichs. Um, and when we get to uh, Ives and Hirschfeld as well, so they are in, in the atmosphere. Now, as we go a little bit further, I wanted to bring up uh, vaudeville theater <laughs> plays an interesting role. Um, so we, we sort of set the foundation for LGBTQ movements in the 19th century. This is mostly in Europe, as we saw. But when we get into the early 20th century, we begin to see more visibility and reform in the United States. And a little bit of, about uh, dress reform we, we've already spoken about with Dr. Mary Walker. But one place where a woman could not be persecuted for wearing men's clothing was when it was for the purposes of entertainment. And Florence Tempest, who we see here, uh, she was an American vaudeville comedian in the early 1900s who portrayed boy characters, usually pining for the love of their sweetheart. And uh, you, you see her here with her hit songs, I love the ladies and I want a boy to love me. So she and her sister often performed together with, with Florence playing the boy and Mary and her sister playing the girl. So to see this on stage, it was accepted by audiences to see this as entertainment. So Florence Tempest was really an early forerunner for drag and paved the way for both men and women to perform as drag kings and drag queen entertainers. Uh, now, as we keep going on into the 20s in entertainment, we also have the legendary blues singer Ma Rainey. So Ma Rainey, she got her start in Columbus, Georgia, and she started in entertainment when she was only 13 years old. And there is a, a fair amount of evidence to suggest that she was in a romantic relationship with singer Bessie Smith. But regardless, her lyrics and her styles really challenge social norms of the time. Uh, I've brought up some lyrics <laughs> from her song, Prove It On Me Blues. So it's pretty obvious <laughs> um, in the lyrics that she's, she's not a typical woman. So it goes, uh, when I went out last night, had a big fight, everything seemed to go on wrong. I looked up to my surprise, the gal I was with was gone. Went out last night with a crowd of my friends. They must have been women, because I don't like no men. It's true, I wear a collar and a tie. I went out last night with a crowd of my friends. It must have been women, because I don't like no men. Wear my clothes just like a fan. Talk to the gals just like any old man. 
Because they say I do it. Ain't nobody caught me. Sure got to prove it on me. <laughs> so uh, that seems fairly obvious to me, but um, it, it's it's really interesting that even in, in music, uh, and entertainment in particular is a place where uh, queer people or people that are going against the societal norms of the time can be more accepted because it's seen as entertainment. Now, um, I did want to take one moment to pause and say hello uh, to our folks in the chat, so make sure that we're all doing well. Oh, hi, Clavion. Good to see you. <laughs> hi, Jim. Ah, yes, Jim makes a good point that vaudeville theater Peter, uh, people started the gay community in Provincetown, Massachusetts. Oh, I would love to know more uh, interesting local history on that. I see we've got folks from West Virginia, Idaho. <laughs> My bed. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> Watching from home. Love it. All right, seems like we're doing well then. <laughs> So we're going to journey on into the 1920s United States now. So we start to see organizations for gay men and women in the United States form in the mid uh, 19th century a little bit, but it's really until the 1920s is when we see these societies or organizations or groups of just queer folk getting together. They are, they're pretty secretive. Um, it's not until 1924 that the first public society is formed in the United States. So this was uh, created by Henry Gerber and the society was called the Society for Human Rights. And Gerber was a, a gay man and interestingly enough, he lived in Germany while he was serving in the army during World War I. And while in Germany, he was able to experience a more open queer culture there. So when he returned to the United States, that encouraged him and influenced him to create the Society for Human Rights. And many of the ideals that were expressed in um, the pamphlets that they created were similar to that of the Declaration of Independence, particularly a person's right to pursue happiness. So it was really a, a an attempt to bring queer people together and in a, a patriotic way, in a sense, to, to live up to the ideals of this promise of uh, every person's right to pursue happiness. Of course, it was really difficult to organize because many gay men feared persecution should they join, and that was a very legitimate fear. Gerber himself was eventually arrested with other group members in 1925, just a year later. So the society's lifespan was very brief, but Gerber continued to write and advocate for gay rights. And it's really quite a big span of time, a few decades. It's not until the 1950s that more public organizations were formed for gay men and women. So we go to uh, 1950, and this is when the Mattachine Society was created by labor activists and uh, communist Harry Hay. And this society was formed in Los Angeles, and it was a way to support um, other gay men in the community. It was essentially a, a social group and a way for gay men to uh, support one another and to talk freely uh, as, as a group. So, Mattachine, what does that mean? <laughs> so, it's a sort of clever um, title because Mattachine refers to a medieval French mask group known as the Societe Mattachine. Pardon my French. <laughs> so, they wore masks while performing entertainments and even some political plays. So, it's fitting that here is a group that they almost have to mask themselves in public. Um, because they are persecuted. So to be a uh, part of the Mattachine group, um, you could essentially unmask yourself when you were among each other. So then we have in 1952, shortly after, One Inc. is formed. And this is formed by members of the Mattachine Society, and it's led by an activist named Jim Kepner. And One Inc., provided literature to promote and advocate for gay and lesbian communities. 
So this was really the first widely distributed magazine for gays and lesbians. And the magazine, it included articles, short stories, uh, book reviews, letters to the editor. So it really was a, a go-to source for support, information, affirmation in um, the queer community at the time, which focused largely on lesbian and gay uh, men and women. So the magazine actually, it continued until 1996, which is pretty astounding. And then it was only because it merged with the Institute for the Study of Human Resources. And that uh, institution is led by transgender philanthropist uh, Reed Erickson. So in a way, its legacy has certainly continued. And when we go to 1955, that's when we see almost like a sister organization of the Mattachine Society. Um, it was created by Del Martin and Phyllis Lyon, and it was called the Daughters of Belitis. Yet another, what does that mean, name, and, and we will get to that. So this was the first lesbian civil rights organization in the United States. And similar to the Mattachine Society, it offered support for women who were afraid to come out. And it even began offering educational materials about gay rights and gay history at the time. Now the name uh, Belitis, that refers to what's called uh, Songs of Belitis. That's a, a poem by the French poet Pierre Louis, which portrays a, a fictional lover of the female Greek poet Sappho. So they're, they're taking that, um, another piece of history and creating their name with it, which is pretty cool. So I'm gonna check on the chat, see how y'all are doing so far. All right, excellent. Great to have you all here. All right, so now we're going to talk a bit about literature as we've already discussed um, some of the magazines and pamphlets. So literature played a, a significant role in communication in the earlier queer communities of the United States. So in 1928, not too long after the Society for Human Rights was organized, British author Radcliffe Hall published The Well of Loneliness. And this is a, a fiction book that revolves around a love story between two women who face discrimination for their relationship. And while other novels may allude to queer relationships in vague terms, Hall was fairly open uh, in her novel, and I'll share two excerpts from it. So here we have, If our love is a sin, then heaven must be full of such tender and selfless sinning as ours. <laughs> and next we have, you're either unnatural nor abominable. Oh, excuse me. You're neither unnatural nor abominable nor mad. You're as much a part of what people call nature as anyone else. Only you're unexplained as yet. You've not got your niche in creation. So as you can imagine, um, reading this novel, especially as a, a lesbian woman at the time, would have been very affirming and quite different um, than any other novel that you could typically pick up. So, but that was in 1928 and we're going to now jump <laughs> to 1947 because there were those few decades when certainly there was still some level of organization going on, but we don't have it well documented. So uh, we can assume that, that queer folks were uh, meeting and supporting one another, but as far as uh, documented sources, it, there's really a, a lack of um, information between the, around the 30s and 40s. So we're going to jump to 1947. And I like this story a lot. This is, <laughs> this is pretty interesting. Um, this is when Lisa Ben began her magazine for lesbians titled Vice Versa. And this is the earliest known magazine specifically for the lesbian community. And uh, like I said, I, I, I find the story fascinating because Lisa Ben was actually a pen name and uh, for Edith Ide. And you might note that uh, Lisa Ben is an anagram for lesbian. <laughs> so uh, Edith Ide, she was a secretary for RKO Studios in Los Angeles, which, which was uh, one of the major studios in Los Angeles at the time. 
and she admitted that she had quite a lot of time to herself being a secretary with this job and in fact her boss even insisted that it, he didn't care what she was doing just as long as she looked busy <laughs> so she got busy um, writing her own amateur magazine so twice a month, she typed out five carbon copies and one original of her magazine, vice versa. And these copies were shared among her friends and then their friends and so on. And so the magazine, it was never professionally published, but it stands as an example of how the queer community use literature, even in small circles, to expand their community and their sentiments. And I actually have a photo of uh, Edith or Lisa Ben, as well as the table of contents um, for one of Vice Versa's magazine. And <laughs> please note that the byline says America's gayest magazine, which I just think is super fun. <laughs> so here we have Lisa Ben. So we're actually going to come back to One Ink magazine because uh, in 1953, I also wanted to note the artwork of One Magazine as that really uh, offered queer people um, t visibility to, to see themselves on a magazine was very unusual. Um, so let's take a look at One Ink Magazine. So we can see some of the titles here. They uh, One, One Ink Magazine, like I said before, they published articles, um, short stories, poetry, letters to the editor. It really was almost like a social platform in a way uh, for its time. So uh, to see something on a magazine that says, I am glad I am homosexual, to see um, uh, on the magazine homosexual marriage be called into question in 1953 is, is pretty fascinating. And then, of course, we, we also have a depiction of um, of someone in, enjoying music and the arts. So more than politics, of course, uh, this was a really wide ranging magazine. So let's go back because we also have the Daughters of Belitis, which we had mentioned before, and they published their own magazine in 1956. And this is called The Ladder. And that title, The Ladder, is referring to the ladder out of the well of loneliness described by Radcliffe Hall. So this was clearly, uh, Radcliffe Hall had made quite an impression in uh, the lesbian community. And so to have that title refer to this, this ladder uh, coming out of the well of uh, loneliness is a really nice connection there. The latter also included articles, news, and views on politics of the time, uh, interviews, letters to the editor, short stories, poetry, very much um, similar to that of One Ink magazine. And, uh, and this was um, particularly important to the lesbian community in San Francisco where it was published, whereas One Ink, um, that, would, that was from New York. So now we have the West Coast as well with uh, a a large lesbian population uh, publication, excuse me. So a decade later, we have the first openly queer bookshop, and this is opened in 1967 in New York City, and it was owned and operated by Craig Rodwell, and he was a gay rights activist who had also published his own periodical called The Hymnal, as well as an advocacy group for gay youth. And his bookshop was called the Oscar Wilde Memorial Bookshop, as Oscar Wilde was a well-known gay author of the 19th century. And this bookstore, it was in business for quite a long time, from 1967 all the way up until 2009, where unfortunately uh, the recession played a role in its closing. But a long, long history. So we also can take a look at um, the ladder. So here we have covers from the ladder and we see the, <laughs> the actual literal ladder that they've uh, depicted over here. But to also see lesbian women on uh, the page of a magazine, both black and white, uh, very different for the time. And um, I also have an example of the table of contents 
Uh, they stated their mission in all of their magazines, uh, the mission for the Daughters of Belitis. So you can see that um, education is quite uh, important to them. And in the table of contents, you can see examples of the types of content that they would have. So from short stories, um, political articles, an interview. So this was, uh, magazines and literature like this was incredibly important. And we also have a picture of Craig Rodwell. Here he is at the Oscar Wilde Memorial Bookshop. And uh, this was also a meeting place for many queer folk in the New York area. So it, it played a central role in the queer community there. Now, an event that I wouldn't be surprised if most of you have heard of by now is the Stonewall Uprising. So now we are in the late 1960s and uh, on June 28th, 1969, there was a police raid at a gay bar called the Stonewall Inn. And this raid ended up turning violent and led to six nights of protest and civil unrest. Now, a lot of the information about what actually happened that night is anecdotal and has been documented in oral history interviews, but uh, it varies from different witnesses but what is known that, like many clubs and bars, the Stonewall Inn was actually mafia run. So police raids were fairly common and the raids were becoming too common, of course, for the patrons because it usually led to the harassment and the arrest of patrons, um, those who were wearing clothes that went against the New York law at the time that made it illegal to not wear clothing appropriate to their biological sex. So Stonewall, though, was really seen as a tipping point uh, in the frustrations that had already been fueled in the gay community at the time from those police raids. And also, it's, it's, it's good to also keep in mind that there are other social movements that are happening by 1969. I mean, we have the civil rights movement, we have the feminist movement, so there's a lot of rebellion in the air. So it's in a way, it's not surprising that eventually uh, this led to the riot. Um, so it, Stonewall was this catalyst for a huge movement of organization and visibility in the gay community of New York City and, um, and beyond. Uh, one of the leaders was Marsha P. Johnson, who you see uh, pictured over there. And she was a well-known actress, uh, excuse me, activist and a well-known drag artist who was also active in the protests following the Stonewall uprising, along with her uh, fellow drag artist and activist Sylvia Rivera, which you see pictured over there as well. Now Johnson then joined the Gay Liberation Front, and this was sort of a, a unifying organization that brought smaller gay organizations and queer activists together to really, to come together and have a unified mission. So the Gay Liberation Front, it extended beyond New York and led to the formation of many other queer and activist groups. So, the Stonewall Uprising was also commemorated by the gay community at large through marches every year in June. And this is in large part why we have pride celebrations uh, in June. So the Gay Liberation Front, um, oh, before I get to that, I did wanna note this, this interesting uh, quote we have here from Michael Fader, who was a witness and a patron of the Stonewall Inn uh, saying, everyone in the crowd felt that we were never going to go back. It was like the last straw. It was time to reclaim something that has always been taken away from us. So again, sort of a tipping point um, that led to much more organization. So back to the Gay Liberation Front, this led to, like I said, fast growth of gay activism and visibility, as well as many demonstrations and protests. And um, one significant protest was in 1969, not long after the Stonewall Uprising. And uh, when 60 members of the Gay Liberation Front they protested at the San Francisco Examiner, uh, the newspaper. Uh, their office about disparaging articles that 
that some of the writers had written about queer people. And the employees, some of the employees of the examiner actually went outside their window and dumped a barrel of ink um, on the protesters below. And then the protesters then used that ink to write messages and make handprints on the building of the examiner. And this became known as uh, the Friday of the Purple Hand. <laughs> so uh, interesting to note there. Now, as we go into the 70s, we have more organizations that are forming. So, and these are uh, also uh, organizations that are becoming a bit more specific to certain groups and minorities. So in 1970, um, lesbians of uh, members of the Gay Liberation Front, they form what is called the uh, Lavender Menace. And that was to protest the exclusion of lesbian women in the feminist movement. And there was, of course, we, we have the feminist movement going on around the same time, but not all women who supported the women's rights or the women's feminist movement agreed with uh, gay rights or lesbianism in general. So the Lavender Menace, it shows how even those fighting for change in women's rights would still be, or could be, against gay and lesbian rights. Now that same year, Marsha P. Johnson, who we just mentioned, and Sylvia Rivera, um, let me make sure that I have our correct slide here. Yes. <laughs> Let's see. Ah, there we go. I think I just got ahead of myself. Sorry about that. So um, back to Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera. So uh, they also created what was called the Street Transvestite Action Revolutionaries, or STAR. And just a, a point uh, of context, transvestite was not necessarily seen as a derogatory term at this time, which is why Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera used that. Today, we would, of course, say transgender. So they create STAR. And this focused on queer youth by providing housing and support, as many queer youth um, did not have stable homes or they would be kicked out of their homes. So to have housing and support of uh, Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera was, was very important. So to see more organizations focused on uh, queer youth is also starting to come about. And uh, yes, I see on this slide now, if you like a little bit more information, that's where we, we talked about uh, both the Lavender Menace. So they were the organization of lesbian members who were fighting against the idea that they could not partake in the feminist movement. And then we also have uh, the story about Friday of the Purple Hand where um, the San Francisco Examiner was protested. So now we're going to go into the 70s here. So throughout the 70s, there, there's really just this explosion of gay activism and organizing. More and more people are coming out and being more visible and support groups are formed like the parents and friends of lesbians and gays. So more allies are advocating for gay rights. People in professional and religious fields are also joining the movement as well, like the National Gay Task Force, which included religious leaders, scientists, legal experts, and activists to promote the equal treatment of gay people under the law and by their community. And we also see groups specifically for queer minorities, like the Kambahi River Collective for Black Lesbians, and the Gay American Indians Organization and the National Coalition of Black Lesbians and Gays. There's also more legal resources that are being provided through organizations like the Gay and Lesbian Advocates and Defenders. So the, the project of um, becoming more visible and queerness becoming not necessarily mainstream, but in the mainstream, um, uh, it's, it's really uh, coming through or coming out <laughs> in, in the 70s. 
So we're going to uh, talk a little bit more about LGBTQ, LGBTQ literature of the 70s. So more and more queer literature is created, like Come Out magazine. Um, there's also an interesting magazine that was specifically for rural gay communities called the Running Water Commune. Audre Lorde's uh, well-known book of poetry called Cole uh, is produced, and this is a collection of poetry about the black lesbian experiences and motherhood. Um, there's also the first book to actually document gay history that comes out, and that's called Gay American History. So we're really seeing a lot of change, a lot uh, of, of momentum in gay activism. Now, um, people are also becoming more visible themselves. So with more visibility, we also see queer people in politics for the first time serving openly gay. Um, so uh, one of the first po politicians to openly serve uh, gay uh, is Elaine Noble, who uh, was elected as a state legislature. And we also have uh, Harvey Milk, who you're, you may be familiar with as there was a, a very big bio flick made about him. So Harvey Milk, he was elected as a county supervisor in San Francisco. We also see more protests in the form of boycotts. So um, one particularly uh, famous boycott was the boycott against the Florida Citrus Commission, whose spokeswoman at the time, Anita Bryant, um, she advocated for the repeal of ordinances that prevented discrimination against LGBTQ people. So because she was uh, the spokeswoman for Florida Citrus Commission, uh, there was a movement to boycott that. Now, uh, during the 70s, we also have the uh, pride rainbow flag becomes a visible symbol of queerness. And this was designed by Gilbert Baker. And it was first flown at uh, the Gay Freedom Parade in 1978. So we have uh, Gilbert Baker to thank for that. But we also have unrest and protests when Harvey Milk, as you may know, uh, so the county supervisor of San Francisco we just mentioned, he was tragically assassinated. And the protests surrounding the sentencing of um, his murderer, Dan White, uh, the queer community saw it as far too lenient. So that did lead to a lot of protest. Now, as we continue on into the late 70s, one huge event that was um, monumental for the queer community was the National March on Washington for lesbian and gay rights. So over 100,000 people participated and this took place over uh, three days where organizers conducted workshops, they showcased uh, queer art and music, they held activism strategy sessions and focus groups. So from all of these people coming from uh, all walks of life to support uh, gay rights and as well as uh, queer people coming from all over the United States, they're gathering, they're learning. And that and we'll from from the march we're going to see uh, even more growth in with organizations so as we go into the early 80s now we have more societies uh, that are again they're for more specific groups so for instance we have services and advocacy for lgbt elders the bisexual resource center the Gay and Lesbian Alliance Against Defamation, and uh, the Gay and Lesbian Victory Fund, that's a political action committee, committee. and the AIDS Coalition, Coalition to Unleash Power, that's known as ACT UP. Now, of course, the AIDS crisis was an incredibly tragic time for the queer community and included a lot of misinformation and stigma against queer people who, um, well, in general, and particularly in the media. So there was not much movement by the government to quickly create a vaccine um, or an affordable solution uh, or offer really any kind of support for those who were suffering from this new and not very well-known disease. So many queer activists and organizations focused their efforts on the AIDS crisis, which 
of course, is also directly connected to their advocacy for gay rights in general. So ACT UP, the uh, organization um, that was particularly focused on the AIDS crisis, they produced these um, really dramatic uh, posters that read, silence equals death. And I will um, show you now. So. Uh, and that pink triangle that you see, that harkens back to a symbol associated with gay men in Nazi Germany who were persecuted. So this was really meant to grab attention, to make people think um, that if you're ignoring this problem, then you are, you are aiding in the death of uh, part of your community. So they were really trying to make a bold statement with um, this poster in particular. Now, when we get into uh, the 90s, we, in the, in the early 2000s, we have even more advocacy groups. Now, many of them, uh, again, we're seeing advocacy groups for uh, particular niches of the queer community, so queer youth. We see advocacy groups for transgender people. We have groups that are focused on workplace safety for queer people. We have the queer Latinx community involved and uh, the queer black community as well. So notable organizations were the National Youth Advocacy Coalition and that was headquartered in Washington, DC. We have an organization called Pride at Work that uh, worked to ensure safe working environments um, and made sure that queer folks knew their rights in the working environment. And then we also have the Gay Straight Alliance Network, which helps students, so again, a youth organization, start their own Gay Straight Alliance clubs in schools. And then we also have the National Center for Transgender Equality and, and many more. So the 90s, after, uh, this is still sort of that momentum from the gay liberation front. So we're seeing that go all the way into the 90s. Now, um, as we, all of this work, of course, uh, is going to create some changes, uh, not only in our culture, but in the law as well. So I'd like to go over a few of uh, these court cases, so legal successes and challenges. So we had mentioned One Inc. magazine before. So in 1958, One Inc. versus Olson, the Supreme Court reversed a lower court's decision that had found the publication to be obscene. So to have that reversal in 1958, and of course, one magazine goes on for quite a long time after that, it could have been uh, shut down because it was accused of being obscene. Um, but that's a pretty awesome, uh, like, a move for for the queer community to have that reversal in 1958 so that's a really big a big deal one ink versus olson going a bit further into the future we also have an organization called lambda legal and this becomes uh, and i do believe that lambda legal is still in existence to this day but this was the first legal organization established to fight for the equal rights of gays and lesbians specifically in a legal context so before, um, it would be very difficult to find a lawyer to advocate for your position as a queer person, but Lambda Legal, they weren't necessarily all uh, queer folks themselves, but they were lawyers and, and legal teams that did want to advocate and felt strongly about the rights um, of gays and lesbians and, and queer uh, people. So in 1982, uh, we actually have Wisconsin to become the first state to outlaw discrimination based on sexual orientation. So it takes it, it's not until 1982 that we have at least one state to flat out outlaw discrimination uh, based on being queer or whatever sexual orientation that you are. In 1993, we have a sort of what I what I'd call a stepping stone. Um, we have President uh, Bill Clinton signs um, a law known as "Don't Ask, Don't Tell." So this allows gay and lesbian people to serve in the military, and but it removes questions about sexual orientation from the uh, enlistment screening. So if you're not, you couldn't serve openly gay. Uh, but you could serve if you didn't say anything about it. And it, removing that question was a step um, in the right direction, according to uh, the queer community. So um, a stepping stone.
In 1980, excuse me, in 1995, we also have the Hate Crime Sentencing Enhancement Act, and that goes into effect. This is all part of the Violent Crime Control and Law Enforcement Act of 1994. So for hate crimes uh, against someone that, uh, for their sexual orientation, for that to be included is um, another step toward treating um, the queer community equally. In 1996, uh, Hawaii became the first state to recognize that gay and lesbian couples are entitled to the same privileges as heterosexual married couples. So it's really in 1996 where we get those first steps toward um, marriage equality in the queer community. Going uh, a bit further into more modern times, in the early 2000s, we do have the U.S. Supreme Court. They strike down what's called the Homosexual Conduct Law, which decriminal this decriminalized same-sex uh, sexual conduct. So, to have it took until 2003, but it is finally um, struck down. And in 2004 the first legal same-sex marriage um, happens in the United States, and that takes place uh, in Massachusetts between uh, Marsha Kaddish and Tanya McCloskey. In 2009, we have the Hate Crimes Prevention Act. So this is passed as federal law against crimes directed at queer people. So again, reinforcing that discrimination against someone um, for them being queer is going to be seen as uh, a hate crime. And then, in 2010, President Barack Obama signs the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, which then allowed queer people to serve openly in the military. In 2013, we had U.S. versus Windsor, and that was when the Supreme Court ruled that, ruled that defining a marriage as just between a man and a woman is unconstitutional. So in 2013, it was therefore um, ruled that uh, queer people uh, gay and lesbian couples um, could get married. So in 2015, uh, we also have um, Ober... <laughs> I'm going to pronounce this wrong. <laughs> Ober... Oberfell? Sorry about the mispronunciation of that. Versus Hodges. And in this case, the Supreme Court votes that the fundamental right to marry is guaranteed to same-sex couples. Uh, in 2020, not too long ago, uh, the Supreme Court also voted that the 1964 Civil Rights Act does indeed protect LGBTQ employees from discrimination uh, based on their sex. So, of course, that brings us to <laughs> the present. And, of course, uh, even now, activism for transgender rights in particular is, is taking a focus in American politics. Um, queer identities are expanding, such as non-binary people who do not view gender as on a binary, a man or woman. So the journey of gender uh, and identity in our culture, it's far from over. And I do hope that this presentation helped you see the, the big picture in queer representation, visibility, and rights. And I would like to offer you some resources. So I'm going to um, make myself invisible so I get out of the way here. So these are the resources that I used um, for this presentation, and I really recommend all of these. So in particular, Making Gay History was a great podcast with bite-sized interviews and um, just really well produced. It, their interviews from the 70s and 80s, um, majority of them are from the 80s uh, with people like Marsha P. Johnson, Sylvia Rivera. So you can hear from people what their experiences were growing up and throughout the uh, Gay Liberation Front, the movement, the Stonewall riots, really fascinating. Another uh, book was Queer Design. I really recommend this book because of course, with communication having to be relatively secretive, there are many uh, symbols and designs and artwork that was used to convey whether a person was gay or lesbian or queer. And it goes on to talk about uh, more designs that were used for advocacy throughout marches and protests. So really, really great stuff there. 
Uh, if we have any uh, educators out there and you're interested in how to um, uh, talk about these topics, then I would recommend History Unerased for the Classroom. Um, really makes it uh, easy for you to talk about these things, um, whether you're a, a homeschool educator or you're in a position where you can talk about these things in the classroom. There's also a, a queer history of the United States. That was, if you want a more in-depth look, uh, then I would recommend a queer history of the United States. That was uh, really fascinating because it offers uh, more, even more resources in that book as well. And then if you're interested specifically in transgender history, there is uh, the book Transgender History, The Roots of Today's Revolution by Susan Stryker. And I, I found this to be really fascinating too because um, so much of the journey of transgender folks, we can see it through uh, starting in those early days like we talked about with just dress reform and how we can now connect the dots to uh, transgender uh, culture and experiences. And then lastly, I would recommend the Our Family Coalition. They have quite a bit of resources on, if you're not, uh, if you need resources on how to uh, speak to your family about queer identity um, or resources on more LGBTQ history, they, they offer a pretty wide base of resources for you. So that would be a good place uh, to start if, um, if, if you're looking for both personal resources and educational resources. Now, one other resource that I'm excited to share with you is that we have actually, um, I had the pleasure of interviewing um, people for our oral history project and I've uploaded three of our interviews. We, we do have quite a few more that we're going to be uploading throughout the year as our awesome interns um, com complete them. So if you go to our YouTube page, which I mean, you're probably watching from YouTube right now, maybe, but if not, you can go to our YouTube page by using that link and um, you should see the first playlist. It's going to say oral history interviews and the first three interviews that we have listed are for um, our from our Queer Perspectives project. So I hope that you will um, take advantage of that as well. And uh, lastly, if you enjoyed this presentation, I sure hope that you will consider donating. We are, we are a small museum, but your donations make programs like this possible and it makes it uh, much easier for us to uh, present these for free. So every $5 that you donate today is actually gonna enter you into a raffle to win a copy of uh, Travels with Foxfire, which I mentioned earlier. And that book details the experiences and culture of Southern Appalachia. I've uh, thumbed through it. I can't wait to read it myself. Lots of uh, really fascinating information, oral history interviews and that as well. So I hope that you will donate at the link below at bit.ly slash June 21 goal. And again, thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, I wish all of our LGBTQIA plus viewers a happy Pride Month. I will definitely um, go over the chat to see if we had any questions today. I apologize that I w with the time we had today, I just wasn't able to monitor the chat the entire time, but I appreciate all of you being here. And I certainly look forward to you joining us uh, in the chat for our weekly live streams again. So do join us again, we live stream on uh, Wednesdays uh, normally, so Wednesdays at 2 p.m. And you can become a member to enjoy even more of our live streams every Friday at 2 p.m. Thanks so much, everyone. Uh, a happy Pride Month, and I can't wait to see you in the chat again. Thanks for joining us today.